All right, now in Philippians, in chapter number 3, where we just read, a real famous chapter, real great passage of the Bible. Um, it's probably being preached on quite a bit this morning, or between this um, today and next week, um, because we're going to be focusing on the part there about reaching forth, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth, uh, those things which are before because obviously the year is wrapping up. We're coming to an end of things. It's the end of the year. And we're going to be starting a brand new year on Thursday is the first day of our new year, 2015. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I've never been real big on making resolutions, New Year's resolutions. But um, I'm not against them. I mean, I, I think they're good to do. I, I just think that, that the close of a year is a good time to, to take a pause to reflect on the year that you've had, to take a step back and just kind of think of all the things that were done, and also to plan for the future. And one of the good things that, that we have um, with the new year, it's, just, it's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. So if you've had kind of a rough year, if you've had a bad time, hey, you know what? We can just start all over. I mean, thank God we have every day as a new day. Every day you have a bad day, you wake up, you got a brand new day, a fresh start, something new to deal with, something, you know, something new to get your mind focused on. Well, it's the same thing with the months, with the years. As we, as we go on, I think we can, we can just look over the course of the time and say, okay, what have I accomplished this year? What did I fail at? What do I want to do for next year? And I, I do believe whether or not you do it at the start of the year or whatever, it's inconsequential. I just think it's a good time to do it. But um, we all ought to have a plan for our lives. Um, think about the things that you want to accomplish. You ought to have goals. You ought to have a desire to, to do certain things. And I'm going to be focusing on the spiritual things, obviously, this morning in church. Those are the most important things anyways. But... Um, you know, on your job, at work, at my work, there's goals, there's things that I need to do, there's, there's um, tasks I need to complete, and as I work, you know, I'm, I'm going to be more effective when I have a plan in place on how to do it, instead of just going in it all willy-nilly and just haphazardly and not really knowing what I'm doing and just kind of, you know, winging it, so to speak. If there's a plan, it's going to be a lot better for me to accomplish the task I need to get done. That's at work. Well, the things that we have to do for God, they're work also. So we ought to have a plan for ourselves on how to get things done. Now, oftentimes things don't go according to plan. You have to make adjustments. It's easy to get sidetracked. You know, I could look back on some of the things I've wanted to do this year with the church and with serving God, and I've gotten sidetracked on different things. Um, but, you know, you, hopefully we can learn from our failures, learn from, from the things that, that we've done wrong, and keep moving forward. And, and that's the most important thing, is to, is to make sure that our eyes are always focused forward. And that we're not, we're not looking back. Um, you know, maybe 2014 was a great year for you, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. We, everyone has different years. I'm sure some of us have had really good years, and some of us didn't. But... Um, Look at verse number 13 here, because we, it's important not to lose sight of this in Philippians 3, which is why I chose this chapter to read from. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, Paul had for himself a mark. He had a, a mark. He had a point set out before him. He had something that that it's it's a goal, if you will. Now, the Bible is it's not using the word goal, but that mark that he set out before him. That's a goal. It's something that he's looking for to apprehend. It's looking. He's looking to attain this this mark, this prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's had it set out before him, and that's why he says, you know what? I forget those things that are behind. You know why? Because there's nothing you can do about them now. Once it's in the past, it's over. If you've had just a terrible year, if you've failed, if you've backslid, if you've done a lot of things that are wrong, hey, that's behind you now. 
You ought to repent from those things or get right with God or whatever it is that you need to do. But don't dwell on them. Don't continue just thinking and focusing on them. If you're focused behind you, you're not going to be moving forward. You need to keep your eyes set in front of you in order to attain that goal, in order to achieve that high calling. In order to reach that mark, if you're, if you're, if you're looking backwards, you're going to be stumbling around as you're trying to move forward. You need to keep looking forward. Um, now, maybe it was a good year for you. Right? Maybe, you, maybe you had a lot of successes and things were going well and you got a lot accomplished. It's also important, again, not to look back at that and, and you know, live in the past. A lot of people like to live in the past. They have their glory days. They go, oh, back in high school or you know, back when I was young, I could do this and I can do that. And, and just, just, you know, it's fine to reminisce sometimes. Nothing wrong with that. But some people kind of get stuck. They get stuck in a certain, you know, people in their 40s are still talking about high school and that's just all, you know, it's like, okay, you've grown up since then, haven't you? You know, <laughs> hopefully that's not your best years of your life. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully you still have your best years in front of you. Hopefully you can, you can have the mindset where you're thinking, you know what, I want to do more. I want to achieve more as every year that I'm alive goes on. I've learned. Hopefully you've gained some more wisdom and you can continue to apply all of the lessons that you've learned in your life and all the knowledge that you've gotten from God's word and from being in church. And you can apply those to do even more with your life as you progress. But we need to stay focused. Don't get hung up and caught up on the failures. And don't also just get hung up and caught up and, hey, I did a great year. And just, and just continually be focused on that so that you stop doing the work that you need to continue to do. Either way, we don't want to just be, be continually looking back. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, it says for, a, you don't have to turn there. We're going to be going to Philippians chapter 4. But um, Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. If you had a rough year, if you had a, if you had a lot of failures, you know what? The new year, it's a good time to pick yourself back up. Hey, a just man falleth seven times and picketh himself back up again. We need to not get knocked out of the Christian fight. Your Christian life, if, if, if a sin has overcome you, if, you, if you've just struggled and, and had a hard time in a specific area of your life and you feel like you're defeated and this has just really gotten the better of me this year and, and I don't know what to do, hey, pick yourself back up. Keep your eyes looking forward. You know, I mean, yeah, you should be sorry and grieve over, over the things you've done wrong or, or maybe the failures that you've had, but use that grief not to bring you down, not to, not to get you out, but as a motivating factor to say, I don't want to do that again. I'm going to get it right this time. I'm going to pick myself up. And if you keep your eyes looking forward, this is key. This is important to making sure that you can achieve those goals so you can reach that mark, so you can get that sin out of your life, whatever the case may be, whatever the failure may be, to get that out, to, to keep your eyes looking forward. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, Extremely famous passage, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you've had struggles with sin, struggles with failures, with problems in your life, hey, Christ, can, you can do all things through Christ because He's the one that will strengthen you. Make sure, though, that you're deriving your strength from Him. And you're not relying on your own flesh. You're not relying on the world's methods of, of getting rid of sin or whatever it may be. Rely on the Bible. Rely on Christ. Gain your strength from Him and you can do all things. I don't care what sin you're struggling with. If Christ is strengthening you, you can get through it. And let's use this fresh start, this new year, as something that's it's untainted, it's uncorrupted. It hasn't even started yet. It's a blank sheet of paper. Maybe we have all kinds of screw-ups and erasings and cross-outs and everything else from the past year that we've done. And you look at your piece of paper for this year and you're like, oh man, this, is, you know, this, this looks like a nightmare. Yeah. Well, we've got a whole fresh slate, a whole fresh sheet of paper to start with in the new year. And that's, it's encouraging. And that's what's, that, what I like about looking at, looking back and looking forward to the new year is that it should be an encouragement. We can look ahead and say, here are the things that I want to accomplish this year. And, and believe it. And see, I want, I'm going to do it. You know, don't just, don't just have a defeated attitude as you go into it. Oh, well, I'll never do that anyways. Then you won't. 
You won't do it. If, if, if you go into it thinking that you can't do it, you won't. But uh, look, if you would, at Galatians chapter 1, just a few books back from uh, Philippians. We have Ephesians going backwards and then Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to take a look at the, at the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul, just real briefly here, a couple of passages. Because Paul's a great example. He's a great example of someone who's moved forward. And obviously what we read in Philippians was the epistle of Paul coming from Paul about pressing forward towards the mark. Paul's a great example of someone who had done all kinds of sins. He was living a Pharisee. He says, he says, um, he said he was chief of sinners. You know, that he, he was actually working against God. He was fighting against God. He was persecuting the church. He was going out and having people arrested for serving God. That's pretty bad. Okay, that's, that's, that's pretty wicked to be doing that and fighting against God that way. But even someone for the years that he had done that and for, for all that he had done that wasn't right, Look at all the good that he ended up doing because he didn't allow himself to have a defeated mindset. And we'll look at some of these. Look at Galatians 1 verse 13. We'll just read from, from his own words what, what, um, what he had to say about his previous life, if you will, before he got saved, before he started serving God. Galatians 1 13 says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I mean, wasted means he thinned it out. He was, he, was, he, was, he was getting rid of it. He was trying to destroy the church of God. Verse number 14, And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So in one sense, you can say Paul was real successful. He was successful in the Jews' religion. He was successful in that sense. He was zealous in, in keeping those traditions and, and in that, that false belief and in that false religion, he was successful. But look at, turn back if you would to Philippians chapter 3. Should have had you keep a finger there. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to see what Paul thinks about those great successes that he had in, the, in that religion. Philippians 3, we're going to look at verse number 5. We already read this, but we'll read it again. Philippians 3, 5 says, you know, he's talking about himself. He's talking about, you know, he said, if any man think they have whereof the glory, I'm more in the flesh. He's talking about if, if anyone thinks that they, they can achieve so much and they're such a great person in the flesh, he's like, well, I'm even more. Verse number 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. So says, his lineage is good. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. He's of the stock of Israel. He's like, I was circumcised the eighth day according to the law, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. We read that in Galatians 1. He was zealous. He was persecuting the church. He was wasting them. Touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. So according to their law and, and what they were following, what they considered, you know, being a righteous person, yeah, he was blameless. He was following their law to a T. Now, was he following the law of God completely perfect and being blameless in that law? No. But as a Pharisee, according to their traditions and the things that he was doing, and if you remember the Pharisees, one of their, one of their traditions was, um, they said, if, if, you know, my mother or father might be benefited by anything that I give them that, you know, that they called that Korban, which is a gift. Instead of it being, they changed God's commandment of honoring your father and your mother into just into some tradition like, well, you're just lucky if you get what you get instead of, no, God commanded you to take care of them and to honor your father and mother. And um, they made the commandment of God of none effect. So when he said he was blameless concerning the righteousness which is of the law, he was, he's referring to their laws and, and the way that they viewed it because they made it a lot easier to follow their laws and and they were hypocrites anyways they would say to do one thing and do another but um anyways he's, he's saying all this stuff he's like you know i exceeded i excelled i was i i was zealous verse number seven but but what things were gained to me those i counted loss for christ he said all those th all those places i was i was doing well i was being lifted up i was doing better than many of my equals he says, I counted those lost for Christ. Verse number eight, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He's saying all that stuff that I did before when I was being successful as a Pharisee, it was dung. Worthless. Nothing. It stunk. You know, no one wants to deal with it. That's, that's, that's what that stuff was that I did. And other people looked at it like, wow, you're achieving so much. You're doing so great. The world looked at it that way. The false religion looked at it that way. But in God's eyes and Paul's eyes, after he got saved, he says, that was lost for Christ. I was hurting the cause of Christ. And all of those accolades and anything else that my achievements were, it was done. It's worthless. It's garbage. And, um, but did that, did that get Paul out of the fight? Nope. Absolutely not. Paul was one of the best Christians, in my opinion, to ever walk this earth with, with the amount of work that he did for God and the work that he did for Christ. And, you know, he, he recognized he did wrong. He called it what it was. But he didn't dwell in the past. He says, I'm pressing towards that mark. I'm looking forward. And it was evident in his life, too. He didn't just say those words. He meant it. Those words are easy to say. It's easy to stand up behind his pulpit this morning and preach that. It's easy to say, hey, we need to be looking forward. It's a whole other thing to do it. And this is one of those sermons that you have to make the point. You have to decide in your heart and you have to make the application for yourself. Hearing the words is meaningless unless you do something about it. Myself included everybody, every person under the sound of my voice, we need to decide for ourselves what are we going to do with our life? What are we going to do in the next year? What plans are we going to make? Where is that mark for you? What do you plan on doing? And we need to make that real. If your year was already one of successes, we need to set new goals. You know, um, turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because I'm going to go over some things that are basic scriptural works that we need to be doing as Christians. There's a lot of things we can work on in our life, but... Um, Biblically, there's going to be there's just some real basic things I'm going to go, kind of go through on what we should be focusing on this year. Um, and obviously, it's going to go over a lot of things. Some things maybe you're doing just fine with and they're not a problem for you. Other things, maybe they are more of an issue for you. Um, whatever it is for yourself individually, just, just take mental note of and, and plan on working on these things. The ver uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 9 says, But as touching brotherly love... Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So some of the things that maybe you don't have a problem with, you still can be doing more. Verse number nine there said that, hey, you know, brotherly love, you guys are doing good. You know, you don't need that I write unto you. He says, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And then he, and he said in verse 10, hey, and you're doing it. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. So he's saying, good job. You have brotherly love. You don't need that I need to write of you. You're taught of God. You yourselves know it and you're doing it. He says, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. We can always do more for Christ. We can always improve on our walk with God. You can say, yeah, but I'm soul winning. I'm reading the Bible. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Hey, do it more this year. A good example of that might be, you know, you might have a plan for yourself on your Bible reading. And a common, a common goal that people do, especially when you're getting started is, is with Bible reading, is um, reading the Bible once in the entire year. You know, just, just getting through cover to cover. And hey, amen, that's a good goal. That's a great goal. I wish that, I wish that every Christian at least did that. Everyone who's saved would just once a year go through the whole Bible cover to cover. Because most people have never gone through the Bible cover to cover. It's, it's sad, but, but you talk to some people, it's evident. 
we ought to be doing this every year, but not just every year, we ought to be doing it more and more. So if you've already been doing that, say, hey, you know, I've been reading the Bible every year, well, you know, once a year, and you've been doing that for a long time, well, increase that. Get, get a little bit more knowledge, get a little bit more understanding. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to bring this up now. We have Bible reading plans up here in the cabinet. And there's two different kinds. There's, there's this one that I'm holding in my hand, and there's another one that's a little bit more like a little booklet. And they have little check boxes on them. And it gives the plan. We're talking about having a plan. This has the plan all laid out for you already. This one has, okay, your guide for July, my daily Bible reading for July. And it tells you, okay, July 1st, July 2nd, July 3rd. These are what you need to read. And if you follow this plan, if you do according to this plan of what they have laid out here, you will accomplish reading your Bible cover to cover in a year. And it's not that difficult. July 1st, you have to read Psalms 78 and 79. One day. Do you think you can read two chapters of the Bible here? Psalm 78 and 79? I mean, that's just one day. Another one here. Um, most of them are, are closer to four chapters. Isaiah, uh, August 1st, Isaiah 9 through 13. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Not that big of a deal. I, honestly, this, this takes up maybe 10 to 15 minutes of your time. That's it. 10 to 15 minutes. You have 10 to 15 minutes a day to get in the Bible. You could read the entire Bible in a year. This is what I do with my family. It's, I don't use this chart, but we read four chapters of the Bible a day. Every evening, I get my family together and I read out loud to my children and to my wife. And this is part of my Bible reading. But this isn't all I do. I have my own Bible reading time. This is my family Bible reading time. But, you know, obviously I need to be reading as much as possible. I need to be studying. I'm the pastor of this church. I need to know the Word. But just because I'm the pastor, though, you, you know, you ought to know the Word, too. There's no reason you say, oh, well, just because I'm, you know, you, you should, don't just sit there and say, well, just because I'm not the pastor, then I shouldn't know God's Word. No, you should know God's Word because, you know, I, I wish that, you know, I was filled with church that uh, just everyone knew as much or more than I did. I mean, hey, if that's the case, then great. We get, to, <laughs> get someone who knows even more that, up here. That's, that's fine. But, um, you know, if, if that were the case, so we had everybody who just knew lots of Bible, then praise the Lord. Praise God. And that's how you're going to know whether the things that I say are right or true or anything anyways is from you reading your own Bible. But um, I don't want to get too much off topic. The point is to, is to make these goals for yourself and, and to plan out and say, okay, you know what? I've been reading my Bible once a year for a long time now. I think I'm going to try to do it twice this year. Double it up. It's a good goal. Why not? Hey, get through the Bible twice. And once you get into that pattern and that routine and plan it out for yourself. You got to have a plan or else you won't do it. If you want to use these, these little these sheets that we have, you could say, okay, well, um, just, just sit down and plan out, how am I going to do this? You could say, well, one of them I'm going to start in January, and the other one I'm going to start you know, in June or something, and, and I'll read the plan for January in January, and I'll read the plan for June in January, you know, and, and just go through just to make sure you get everything done. So you're not just reading the same thing twice, right? <laughs> you're not doing, okay, Psalm 78 and 79, and then Psalm 78 and 79 again in the same day. You, know, you can read, stagger it a little bit, or... or um, you know, you, there's, all, there's all kinds of different things you do. I'm going to get into all the different ways you can do it. It doesn't matter how, just make your own plan. Make your own plan for how, how you're going to get it accomplished. Because without that plan, you're not going to do it. If your goal is to read the Bible twice in a year, you might, you might if you don't have a plan, what people often do is, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a head start. And you'll read a bunch. But then, in your mind, you start thinking, well, I read a lot, so I'm ahead of the game. It's okay that I don't read it tonight. It's okay I don't read, you know, like, and you start, and you start slacking off. And what's going to happen, it catches up to you before you even realize it. You're not in that pattern. You're not in that schedule. You're not in that time, that, that mindset of, of doing this and saying, no, I'm going to stick to the goal. This is my plan. And, I'm gonna, and this is what I have to accomplish. When you get out of that, that, that way of thinking about it and you just kind of do it slipshod and just, oh, okay well I'm gonna read a lot this day and I'm not, I don't feel like reading today you're not gonna accomplish it it's just not gonna happen 
You need to have that set up. We're, we're pretty strict. If you read four chapters a day, and it's no matter how long the chapters are, if you just read four chapters a day, you'll get through the Bible in less than a year. And that's what we do. And, and when we get to Psalms, I'm doing way more than... And it's like some of those Psalms are real short. They're like four verses, five verses. We'll plow through 10, 15 of those Psalms in one day just because. I mean, we're, because why not? We're spending the time to read the Bible. We might as well read it. But we don't... The only time I think we shorten our reading is when we do uh, Psalm 139. It's because it's like 150 verses. It's real long. Or 175 verses. It's, it's a real long chapter. So we just read that one but we're making up for it the rest of the year. But regardless, I mean, you, you make up a plan that's going to work for you, but make sure that you have a plan. Now, it's important when you're setting goals for yourself, when you're setting up your plan, try not to get overwhelmed. There may be a lot, maybe there's, you know, we're all at different levels in our, in our Christian life as well. Some of us may have more things that we need to work on, more sins to get out of our life, more prayer and reading, and all these other things that we need to work on. Don't get overwhelmed. Pick out the things that are most important for you that, that you think are, are going to have the most impact on your life. I mean, for like if you have a, be, a big sin, hey, focus on getting that sin out of your life, you know, or whatever, whatever it may be. If you've never read your Bible cover to cover, hey, make that a priority that you get through that. There, there's, there's things like that. You know, don't get overwhelmed and say, wow, well, there's so much that I need to do. Getting overwhelmed is going to help you get defeated. You have to take them one at a time. Make, make a list. Just say, okay, these are the things that I want to work on. And spend most of your time focusing on one of them. And you could, you know, you could focus on some of the other things as well. But, but don't spread yourself so thin that nothing gets done. It's better to accomplish some, you know, some goals and fail at others than to try to get everything done and fail at all of them. Because you've spread yourself too thin because you just, you just can't keep up with everything. So that's important. It's also important to set realistic goals. And what I mean by realistic is, don't, first of all, don't make them too easy. Don't, don't say like, well, I'm going to read one chapter of the Bible this year. Huh. Like that, you know, that, that's silly. What are, you, what are you really accomplishing then? Set up a goal where you're going to make some kind of an accomplishment. But also, don't make it too difficult. Don't be like, I'm going to read the Bible 20 times this year, and I'm going to be soul winning 50 hours a week, and I'm going to be, you know, and I'm going to be doing all these different things. Okay, that's not going to happen, right? Make it realistic. Now, you, I'm sure you have great intentions, obviously, to do all these great things and do all this work for God, but, but make it realistic because you want to, the goals ought to stretch you a little bit. It ought, it ought to be a little painful, a little, a little bit of work to, to make sure you're getting it done. But also capable of being accomplished. Because you want to get things done. And if your goal has a, has a time frame, for example, reading the Bible in a year. But something happens and you get thrown off track. Something comes up. Some, you know, whatever. Whatever it may be. Whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. And say, well, I'm not going to reach my goal now because I'm, I'm already behind. You know, the, I, I've missed a month or something and there's no way I can catch up. Extend your time frame out a little bit. Instead of just giving up and saying, well, I just can't do this, it's done. I'm not going to be done by December 31st, so I'm just going to quit. Don't do that. Make the adjustment. Say, okay. I'm going to not reach it in one, within one year, but I'll do it in 13 months, w whatever it may be, okay? It's important not to give up on these goals, because these are good goals. Uh, the, and don't lose sight, the, 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 the point isn't the time frame as much as the reading, right? It's that you, you want to set the goal for yourself, but the most important thing is the actual doing of the reading. You don't want to ever give up on that. Um, and a lot of these things, you know, maybe they, maybe they have a time frame involved, maybe they don't. But um, if things aren't going well, don't just give up. All, any of the work that you're going to be doing in, with, with things of God are going to be beneficial. And they're going to be good for you. And we ought to increase them more and more. Try to be systematic. Write down your goals that you plan to achieve. And make a plan for them. Like give, it, give it some thought. And this is another reason why I like the new year, because... 
You can use this as a time, as I said, with a, with a, a fresh start. But we have a few days still. Just the first thing that you decide to do is say, I'm going to take uh, 30 minutes of my time. I'm, I'm going to uh, schedule out 30 minutes of my time within the next few days. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to think. I'm going to think about the things that I want to accomplish. I'm going to think about what I've already done and how can I improve my life? How can I, how can I do more to serve God? How can I do more to be a better Christian? And think about those things individually for yourself. Write them down. Think, okay, well, this is, this is what I'm going to do to improve in this area. God's, God's worth that time investment. And it'll help you then to maintain that focus, hopefully, throughout the year. Now, here's some examples of things that you can focus on. Obviously, you know, getting sin out of your life. If there's, if there's, if there's a specific sin that you're struggling with, that you have a hard time with, I've gone over in the past different sermons on how to deal with getting sins out of your life, memorizing scripture, you know, spending your time doing other things so that you're not tempted to do, you know, get, get, trying to get rid of as many temptations as possible to, that would, might lead you into whatever sin you're struggling with. You know, wh whatever it is for your case, um, there's ways of doing that. But if that's what you're going to focus on, then, um, you know, remove, when you're removing something, it needs to be replaced with something else. Otherwise, you're not really going to remove it. It's not really going to go away. So when you're trying to get sin out of your life, again, whatever that may be, there's generally different time frames in, in throughout the day where you're going to be more prone to do certain sins than others. I mean, whatever it is. I mean, if it's, if it's like if people drinking alcohol, for example, typically happens in the evening, right? I mean, unless you're an alcoholic and, and just starting off your day with, with booze, generally speaking, people drinking in the evening. So, okay, in the evenings when you would be doing that, right? Fill that time with something else. Come up with something else to do if, if it was a time. Well, I always meet my buddies at the bar to watch football on Sundays or whatever. Go to church on Sundays, okay? <laughs> Instead of going out to the bar to meet up with your buddies. You know, wh whatever it is. Or I don't know. I mean, at dinner, I always have a glass of wine. Well, get, get, get the wine out of your house to begin with. So if it's not there, you can't have it with your, with your dinner. Whatever the case may be, okay? That's just one example. There's so many different things to go to. I'm, I'm not going to preach all about sin. But um, focus and make a plan. Make a plan and say, how am I going to eliminate this sin? What am I going to do about this? How am I going to work on this? And, and, and try to figure that out and put that plan into action. And also, you know, if you do that today, you don't have to wait for January 1st either. <laughs> you don't have to wait. Don't, don't, don't put off your start that you might as well just hey, get a head start on it and do it now. Even if it's by member, I don't care what it is. Get, ahead, get started on it right away. Why not? There's no reason not to. The time frame doesn't matter as much as the actual doing. Other things you go around. Okay, maybe church attendance. Maybe um, church hasn't been much of a priority and you're here, you're not here, or whatever. Um, you know, Bible talks about being in church is important and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And if that's an area that you think you need to improve on, just, you know, again, Work with your schedule. Maybe you work. Maybe you're doing other things. Um, make whatever um, changes might be necessary to, to come to church more frequently. Bible reading. I went over that quite a bit. Bible studying. Maybe you're someone, you say, I've already read the Bible a bunch of times. I've read it cover to cover. Now, I don't recommend Bible study until you've done the Bible reading. You need, to, you need to go through the Bible a few times before you really start studying because you need to make sure when you start studying that you get, you know what the Bible says in context, that, that you're already familiar with, some, with just through reading of what the Bible's saying in general. Then you start doing the studying and, and looking up different topics. And if you haven't done your own Bible studies, hey, do them. Whatever topic is interesting to you, think, you know, say, hey, I want to look up all the, you know, get a concordance. You, you know, there's all these different tools you can use. Or just, for, hopefully, if you've read the Bible enough times from your memory, say, you know, I think I was talking about this somewhere in Galatians or somewhere in Romans. or so, you know, and, and, and specifically look for um, what you're doing. Or during your, during your regular Bible reading, you can make note. You have one thing in mind that you're looking out for. 
and say, you know what? You know, I've heard people talk about this doctrine of, of the giants and the angels as being the, you know, the sons of God and all this other stuff, but I, I don't know what this is for me. I want to know this for myself. Hey, every time you come across those passages, write them down. Make a little list for yourself. This pertains to this subject. And then as you go through the Bible within a year, you, you should have gone through the whole Bible and you could have all of your notes and say, now you can study it. Now you can really dig in and say, okay, it talks about this here. Here's all of the, the, the pertinent scriptures that I need to look at. We ought to be studying those things. And if you haven't done a Bible study before, do it. Do it for yourself. It, 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 it increasingly, it, it really increases your knowledge of the Bible. That's what I do. When I prepare my sermons, I am doing Bible studies. Because a lot of times, oftentimes what I'm preaching on is a specific topic in the Bible, like a specific sin or, or, or whatever it may be, whatever the topic is. I'm going back and I'm, I'm going a lot off of my memory from just from reading the Bible a whole bunch of times. Oh yeah, it talks about this here. Oh yeah, it talks about this here. You know, Philippians 3 was a no-brainer for this sermon this morning. Okay? That was easy for me because I've read it so many times, a familiar passage. Yeah, this is a great example, biblical example to use to, to express the point that I'm trying to make here. Um, it's a great truth from the Bible about Paul, you know, trying to reach that mark and setting that goal and keeping his eyes forward. All those, that's, all, that's all truth found in the Bible. But um, Bible studying, Bible memorization, another important aspect of the Christian life. And again, these are, depending on where you're at spiritually, maybe, maybe you just need to focus on the reading. Maybe you're good with the reading. Hey, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm increasing more still. Work on the studying. Work on the memorization. These are all important things. Soul winning. Preaching the gospel to every creature as we're commanded to do. Making the time to do that. Say, you know, we've got a couple of scheduled times. You can show up to that. Or you can just say, well, you know, I'm not going to, I can't make it to those times or for whatever reason. But, you know, I do this other thing. You know, I'm always at, at this place, I'm always at this park, I'm always at wherever, and I'm going to make it a point to approach people and, and actually, you know, try to give them the gospel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things, I'm going to incorporate this more into my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be focused on this more, because if you're not thinking about it, you won't do it. Especially with soul winning. If you're used to doing, to doing your daily routine, and you come into contact with people, maybe go grocery shopping or whatever, if your mind isn't on the things of God, if you're not thinking about the Bible, if you're not thinking about God's Word, you're probably not going to be talking about it to anybody either. It needs to be a concerted effort. These things don't just happen by accident. Getting somebody saved doesn't happen by chance. It requires effort. It requires you to be thinking, hey, I need to preach the gospel to this person. And however you plan on achieving that, if that's something you need to work on, then, then work on that for this year. Set a goal for yourself and say, hey, I would like to get at least 10 people saved this year, 12 people saved. That's one person through I have an entire month, every month, to, to just focus on making sure that I preach the gospel enough times that one person will be willing to, to put their faith on Christ. Something to that effect. That's one of the reasons why we keep track of the, you know, the numbers are important because they, they refer to people. And it's one of the ways that we can motivate ourselves to say, hey, I want to, and you know, uh, and I, let me say this briefly about the soul winning aspect and the numbers. Don't get so focused on the numbers and achieving that number goal that you don't do a very good job of giving the gospel just to say, oh, this person got saved when they didn't. That defeats the entire purpose whatsoever because then that number is meaningless. If the person doesn't get saved, that number is meaningless. It doesn't even count. And you should know for yourself that, that you know, when, when you're making that goal, <laughs> the goal should not be the number. It should be you honestly want to get these people saved. And if that's your motivation, then you're going to do everything, be thorough, just, just be as, as best as your ability you can do it. Make sure the person understands the gospel and they're, and they're actually putting their faith in Christ. You know, not, you're not just trying to rack up a bunch of numbers. Because there are people that do that. There are churches that get real, um, don't do a very good thorough job. And unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of people who condemn 
the soul winning and a lot of soul winning that we'll do of going out and talking to people door to door and they'll say, oh yeah, you got these people saved because they're used to what they've, they've seen what other churches have done where they do this and it's called like this one, two, three, repeat after me. And it's just like a sales pitch. You say, okay, well, do you believe that you've sinned? And you believe that Jesus died for you? Okay, well, let's pray right now and you're saved and people are getting saved in like a minute. Okay, that's ridiculous. You have to go through and be thorough. But that doesn't mean that because people are doing it that way and they're not doing a good job and people aren't getting saved because they're just, just trying to run through some scripture and just, and, and you know, they're, they're doing it more of just a sales pitch than they're actually like concerned about the person and having a conversation and trying to get them to comprehend and understand the gospel. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work just because other people are doing that. Okay, We don't do that here. We take the time. We ask questions. We engage and have conversations with people. It's not just one person doing all the talking. When we go out soul winning, I don't just preach at somebody and then just pray with them at the end. I speak and communicate with them and talk to them and say, you know, here's an example. What do you think about this? If a person were to do this and, you know, if they were to believe on Christ and then they were to go out and sin, do this other stuff, and, you know, like, like, what do you think would happen to that person when they die? Would they go to heaven or hell? And get them thinking about it, get them engaged and, and see what they're really thinking out of their heart. Is that faith in Christ enough or do they actually have to do works? There, there's lots of things that we do and when we have our communication and a dialogue with people, to see if they even understand. And then once we know they understand and comprehend the gospel and comprehend the free gift, then they can make that decision. Well, do you want to accept that gift? Is that something that you are willing to put your faith on? You're willing to stake your eternal soul on Christ or not? And once they have that understanding, then they can do that. But that's how we do the soul winning. So when, when you're making a plan for yourself, obviously it needs to be along those standards. High standards of, of being thorough with the gospel. And keep that in mind then when you make your goal and say, okay, well, this is what I want to do. These are the people. I want to reach at least this many people in the year. And, um, and make that plan for yourself. Prayer. Another important part. This is something that I've struggled with from time to time. It's, um, but it has to be done. It's important. And prayer works. Prayer. God answers. God is a God that answers prayer. I love that God answers prayers. We have to, if you, if you don't ask for things, oftentimes you won't get them. We see men in the Bible praying for an hour. An hour. An hour of their day spent just praying. Think about that. That's a, that's a significant chunk of time. But that's how important prayer is in their life. How important is it to you? If this is an area, maybe there's a lot of things that I mentioned, and you know, I'm doing good in a lot of those areas. What about prayer? What about preaching? Okay, I've met for this is specifically for the men because, you know, there may come a day and it's not wouldn't be outside the realm of norm, normality that that I would be too sick to preach or that that something would come up where I'm not going to be able to make it to preach in a sermon. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to take over and be the pastor of the church and as everything's going to run, but but men ought to be prepared and ready to preach in case something comes up. So you can you could run the service, you could take over and, and you can preach a sermon. You could have a message prepared. You could have something ready to go. I know this is something that, that I was tasked of of, of doing in, in my former church before I became a pastor. I always had a sermon ready to go that if I was called upon if, if, if something came up and it happened periodically, where my pastor was unable to be at, at the service. Whether it be due to illness or some other event that came up that was just, you know, I mean, that prevented him from being there. I was always ready. And the men in this church need to be ready to do the same thing so that we could continue. You know, church isn't all about me. It's about us coming together. So if I, if I can't do something for some reason, someone else needs to be prepared and ready to stand behind the pulpit and, and preach a message. Now, you know, Whatever, whatever it is you're capable of doing, great, but, but we can't just say, like, well, church is canceled. You know, we ought not to because Pastor Burzens isn't here preaching. And, and it's a good skill to have anyways, um, being able to preach the Bible, being able to preach a message. And, um, and it, song leading as well, you know, it's, that's another thing. And I, and I haven't, um, I think I'm going to be doing some classes on that pretty soon just so that we can do some real basics on, on leading the songs. It's not that difficult, but um, 
there are a few th little points and keys and, and tips that you can learn that would be beneficial for that. But um, let's look at, turn if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I think you were just in chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're going to see a few other biblical examples. I just gave you a, a list of examples without really turning to uh, Scripture so much to back them up. But here's some other examples. I gave you all those, you know, getting rid of sin, church attendance, Bible reading, Bible studying, Bible memorization, soul winning, praying, preaching, songing, all these different things you can work on this next year. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Look at verse number 14. He says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay, these are all things that you can work on as well. They're all important parts of our life. Giving thanks, praying, not quenching the spirit. Quenching the spirit means, hey, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's trying to, to lead you and guide you. And, and, and help you to, to learn, understand, and, and pushing you to do things, don't quench that. Don't say like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and, and, and resisting and going against the Holy Ghost and, and quenching it so that you're not allowing yourself to be led of the Spirit. Um, you know, not rendering evil for evil. Um, it says warn them that are unruly. You know, within the church, people who are you notice they're starting to get a little bit out of hand. They're starting to do some things that they shouldn't be doing. You know, give them a warning. That's out of love. You know, um, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. These are all things, all areas of our lives that, that we may struggle with individually. Just, just trying to give you some more ideas of things to look at. We, we all need to grow. Okay, I, if you sit here and tell me, nope. Every single thing that you mentioned, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing great. Let's, what else you got for me? Then you need to work on your humility. <laughs> because <laughs> those are a lot of things. And I don't know anyone who is excelling so much at all of those that they don't need to work on them. Okay. And, and we all need to just look. But try to focus on the things that you think are the most important in your life. Make that plan and make the time. When, you, when you're making your plan, it has to fit in your day somewhere. You have to kind of schedule that in. If it's prayer, when are you going to do that? In the morning, evening, middle of the day, or whenever you have, you have to decide, when am I going to do this? And stick to it. Make the plan and stick to it. Um, it's really important. I had a lot more to go about the planning. Um, I'm just not going to be able to get to it, though. Unfortunately, uh, maybe I'll get into it a little bit more tonight. But basically what I was going to go into is in 1 Chronicles 22, it talks about how David prepared for the house of the Lord, for the temple to be built. Preparation is key. And, and, and again, I, I, can't I can't overstate this on how important it is. If you want to do something with your life, if you have a goal, if you want to do something great for God, something big for God, you have to have a plan. No plan means it's not going to get done. Now, building the temple was a great work that they were doing for God. That required a lot of planning and a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of effort. David did as much as he could since he wasn't allowed to actually do the building. He says, well, I'm going to do the preparation. I'm going to make sure Solomon has everything that he needs. I'm going to get all this work done so that he can get this job done. And he did the planning and the preparation. And um, it says in 1 Chronicles 22 that David prepared. He prepared all the materials, iron in abundance and brass. And you know, he got all the raw materials together. He was, he was getting people ready to go to do the work for it. And um, 
one of the, and you don't have to turn it, I'm just going to read a couple verses I've highlighted here because they're, they're kind of important for what I'm describing. Verse 5 says, And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and of glory throughout all countries. So he's saying this is a big thing. I want this to be magnificent. This is a great work for God. I am, I am really want this to turn out great. This is for the Lord. This is for God. And all the things I mentioned, hey, do those things for yourself, but do them for God. The work that you're going to be doing, the soul winning, the church attendance, the Bible reading, the Bible, you know, everything that you're studying, doing, do it for the Lord. Say, I am going to do this to please God. I'm going to do this as a work for God, and I want it to be done right, and I want it to be great. That's how important it is. So he says, I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly. He, was, he wanted to make sure that, what, that that work was magnificent. So he prepared abundantly. If you want to do great work for God with your life, you need to prepare. It needs to be prepared abundantly. And then at the, the end of that chapter, he says, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. Your heart and your soul need to be set to make these preparations to serve God and to, and to improve in your Christian life. Now, I have, I'm going to just go over real briefly, our church-wide goal. I've come up with a goal for our church. And this is not just me. Now, I'm going to, I already know the way I'm going to try to improve on a lot of these things. But I want this church to double in every aspect. I want to get double the amount of souls saved this year. I think it's doable. Now, we had a lot of, a lot of salvations from the, from the soul winning marathons we had where people came up. But I still think it's, I th I think it's possible. I think we could reach 200 next year. I think it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And everybody's going to have to participate. Everyone's going to have to get involved in this effort in order to do it. But we can do it. That's why it's a church-wide goal. We're all doing this together. Um, I would like to double our attendance in church. Now, I've said this before. You know, the, the, the point of church isn't just to fill it with bodies and people. But I want to get people who love this church and I want to get more people in this church. I don't want to stay small. And the reason being is because I want to have a lot of people that love God and want to serve God and are, are with us in the unity of faith here together. And that's what my goal is as well, is to double our attendance. We've been running around 10 and I want it to be at least 20 people by the end of next year. I think that's very doable. I think we could accomplish that. Now there's some... There's, some aspects of the way that I go soul winning and I, that I've talked to some of my other friends that are really good soul winners. I've talked to other pastors and, um, and I've got some good advice from them on, on trying to get people interested more because it's not easy. It's, you know, it's, it's easier to get someone saved than it is to get them in church. It's, it's not always easy to get. I mean, oftentimes they're going to other, and especially in this town, people are going to other churches already. They already have a church they're going to. They don't always necessarily see the, the need to, to change churches. I think there's a very good reason to change churches, though. I think there's, a, there's I, I don't know of any of the churches here. You know, I don't know them all, but I, I don't know of any that's really doing what we're doing with preaching the gospel and, and just preaching the word of God the way that we're doing it. It's, it's not, it doesn't seem to be around here. And I think that's a very good reason for people to come to our church. We're old-fashioned. We're not changing. We're not, we're not changing with the times and, and, and allowing all the, the rock and roll and all the other things that infiltrate the church just to, just to get people you know, a sense of entertainment. That's not why we're here. And I think there's a lot of people that they, just, they may not even realize that, but I, I need to stress that some more. But um, that's, that's our church-wide goal. I want to double everything. Double the size, double the, and, and I want double the, at least double the amount of soul winners that are going out and knocking on the doors too. I want to get people who are, you know, double the baptisms, double everything. I think that's a very, very good goal to have and, and you know, for a young church, yeah, maybe a slow growth, but those slow growths, if it's, you know, it, 
We're talking from 10 to 20 people in church. Okay, you know, that's, that's still only 10 people. That's not that many people, but it's double our growth. And you think of a tree that grows, yeah, it doubles its growth. There's its size, excuse me, it doubles its size and not too long of a time. Is it slow to get into be this huge, massive tree? Of course, it's a slow growth. But in the early stages, doubling is, is very, very realistic. And I think we ought to be able to do that. We ought, that that's our goal. And, that's, and I would like everybody to stay focused on this goal and to work towards it. So there's lots of ways we can achieve that. I didn't really go into detail on that. We're kind of running out of time. But, um, you know, with, with getting the word out, with the flyers, with, with all kinds of different methods to, to try to, to reach people. But the most important method is going to be individually talking to people. That is, that is way more valuable than any flyer, than any printed ad, than anything else that we can do. And we're never going to stop doing that. But we need to do as much as possible of individual re individually reaching people. Preaching the gospel, making sure they're saved. If they're not saved, try to get them saved and get them in church. And if they're already saved, try to get them in church. And, um, and, and get them growing. Because we don't want to do this all by ourselves. If, we, if, we, if, if, it were just, if it was just where we're at right now, there's no way we could accomplish the, the bigger goals of reaching this whole community, reaching this town, reaching Prescott. We're not going to be able to do it. There's too few of us. We need to get more people on board on our team, in our family, in our church family here, growing and doing more for God. Because the more people we have doing that, the, the greater things we can do for the Lord. That's why it's important. So, um, you know, that's our church-wide goal. But, and maybe you can incorporate your personal goals to work with the church-wide goals as well. I mean, there's a lot of overlap there. But, um, you know, let's use, let's use this new year as a fresh start. Take the time out to identify for yourself where you want to work on this year. And once you've decided on it, just get started. <laughs> Don't wait till Thursday. Get started right away. And um, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and for your words and for the encouragement. God, I pray that, that something in the message this morning will be encouraging the people here. Help us all to be motivated to... to do more for you, dear Lord, to work harder, um, to, to just get a lot of things accomplished that will bring honor and glory under your name and that would prevent people from going to hell. And that, um, Lord, we want to be pleasing to you. We pray that, that through all of our goals and our planning that you would be leading us and guiding us and instructing us every step of the way, dear Lord. Um, without your power, we can do nothing but with Christ, you know, we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us, dear Lord. And we thank you so much for that strength and for the power of the Holy Spirit, dear Lord. We pray that you would please just send us out under that power to, to accomplish more in 2015. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.